Xbox has been having a really rough time of it, which all seems to be of their own making. And now we have this interview where Sarah Bond, who is the president of Xbox, has been interviewed by Dina Bass from Bloomberg. And lots of you have been talking about this interview. A few of you have sent me this saying you need to check this out. So now we're going to react to it right here, right now, Sarah, and see what it's so all about. So today. let's go. So I want to start talking about the industry in general. Uh, you and Microsoft Games. And remember, this is after they've shut down. This this was filmed or released the day after they shut down Tango Gamesworks and a couple of other studios. So let's see if that comes up as well. The if they can Spencer, salvage this in any way. The, the video game industry is just not growing. And there's a real need to figure out how to reverse that. What's causing the issue? And, and how, does, how does Xbox turn it around? Yeah. Sorry, before she even answers, before Sarah even answers this, this narrative that the it's just not growing, I, I think it's, I just don't believe it. I feel like this is like some sort of marketing PR speak. It's like, I don't think gaming has ever been more popular. I think certain brands within gaming have problems because they've not launched good games. You launch a good game, trust me, the gamers will follow, the money will follow. So let's see if she maybe addresses that, that maybe Xbox is offerings have been weak as of late so i mean this gen it has been pretty poor so let's see what she says you know um the last year or so mm -hmm. in video games largely the industry has been flat um and even in 2023 we saw just some tremendous releases um tremendously groundbreaking games but still the the growth didn't follow all of that um and, you know, a lot of that's related to our need to bring new players in, um, make gaming more accessible. But all of that has been happening at the same time that the cost associated with making these beautiful AAA blockbuster games is going up. And the time it takes to make them is going up. And so, so much of our focus uh, as Xbox is about how we do things to help the industry all up um, while also ensuring that our brand, you know, everything that we do is there through this moment of transition. Okay, another thing I would add to that, yes, making AAA games is getting way more expensive. Everything in the world, unfortunately, is. Um, but I think that also adds to their problem that with everything getting more expensive, People do not have the same disposable income that they may have previously had. So buying games, you know, they'll maybe buy that one big game they're looking forward to or, you know, support some indie games they're really looking forward to because they don't have the budget for just buying a new game every other week or whatever. But pff, I don't know how I feel about our answer there with the, creating all these amazing AAA games. I mean, when was the last time Xbox released legit, a, a, like, universally recognized amazing triple-a game this might be controversial i would push the boat out there and say it was forza horizon 5 everyone loves forza horizon 5 like forza motorsport i think it, hit, it, it missed the mark I, I didn't think it was very good i actually preferred forza motorsport 7 and then you've got starfield which was kind of lukewarm you know, it didn't really feel like a next-gen AAA blockbuster. The loading screens, constant loading screens, were just so jarring for me, especially with all these super-fast um, storage, which these consoles have. You think it would just be able to zip through these things, but it just felt like a previous-gen game. Um, so, yeah, interesting answer. But, again, President of Xbox, these people will be, you know, PR-trained to the max. It will be, you know very diplomatic and for investors and all that kind of stuff. So let's see what else she says. Related to some of the trends you're identifying, uh, you know, earlier this week, Xbox announced the shuttering of four game studios. I, I know you're not the studio's chief, but how should we, how should gamers understand that move in terms of Microsoft's commitment to developing innovative, exclusive games? Good yeah, question. You know, it's, it's always extraordinarily hard when you have to make decisions like that. Um, Fair play. You know, I'll go back to what I was saying about the industry. And when we looked at those fundamental trends, we feel a deep responsibility to ensure that the games we make, the devices we build, the services that we offer 
are there um, through moments, even when the industry isn't growing and when you're through a time of transition. And the news we announced earlier this week is, is an outcome of that. Uh, and our commitment to make sure that the business is healthy for the long term. Uh, but, but that said, our, our commitment to having our own studios and working with partners to have games large and small, you know, we're a platform where you can play GTA, but you can also play Pal World, where you can play Call of Duty, and you can also play Pentiment. That, that doesn't change. Um, and frankly, our commitment to the to Bethesda and the role that it plays is part of Xbox and everything we do. It's actually been pretty fantastic. I don't know if you've gotten a chance to check it out. Um, the Fallout TV show was on Amazon, and it's been great to see people. The Fallout TV show? I thought, wait a minute. I thought that was actually an okay answer. She was saying, you know, trying to keep the business healthy and protective of the future. These tough decisions kind of need to be made, kind of what she was trying to say, even though because it's Microsoft, you are a bit like, what? You know, you're a trillion dollar company, you've made billions, and then it's these smaller studios, is that going to make such a huge difference? I don't know, but maybe they just look at it, the bottom line, these, it's the, it's the, what do you call it, the suits making the decisions now? These companies um, are not making enough profit for us, Pfft, they're gone. I mean, people forget, this is Microsoft, it is a massive, ruthless company. That is how they're so powerful and successful. You know, they're not your friend, so... But I don't know where she's going with this, with Fallout TV show. This has no relevance, I don't think. Fall in love with that universe, but also what it's done for the games themselves. And people going back and exploring everything that's inside of that. There's some other great things that are coming from our studios later this year. Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. I was a big indie fan growing up. Uh, looks like you were too. Um, uh, so you should check that out. Looking forward to Indiana Jones. Um, but really right now for us and our teams, our focus is on the people impacted um, and doing everything that we can do to help them through this hard transition. I think one of the things that was most upsetting, both to Xbox then. gamers and to em employees, is that you know one of the shuttered studios in particular just created a hit game, did really well on Game Pass in, in terms of engagement and won a ton of awards. I, shouldn't succeeding in that way ensure the future of, of a studio? And how many Xbox executives and, I don't know, people online did we see saying how successful Hi-Fi Rush was and it hit all their metrics and this and that and it won a bunch of awards and a really unique creative game. And then now the studio's gone, so let's see what she says. You know, one of the things I really love about the games industry is it's a creative art form. And it means that the... I kind of feel sorry for her here. She does not look comfortable at all, does she? But then again, I mean, she's president of Xbox is a big time role. Like, I guess this comes with the territory, doesn't it? The situation and what success is for each game and studio is also really unique. Like, there's no one size fits all to it for us. Um, and so we look at each studio, each game team, and we look at a whole variety of factors when we're faced with sort of making decisions and, and trade-offs. <laughs> what? Bloomberg have put up Microsoft Xbox year over year growth. So, so this is the, what is this actually showing? I can't see the detail. Is this the, the, the money they're making each year? So they're making a shed load of cash. Wow, you feel like they're being trolled a little bit here. Like that. Uh, but it all comes back to our long-term commitment to the games we create, the devices we build, the services, and ensuring that we're setting ourselves up to be able to deliver on those promises. Talking, um, you know, for... So, there's two parts to that. Again, who am I? I'm just a, I'm just a gaming fan. What do I know, right? But that was a good answer in terms of, you know, she probably hit a few bullets there and a bit uh, eloquent, but she didn't actually answer the question. It didn't say anything about 
Uh, I don't know. Let's further see. Further about growth. I mean, one of the key focus areas for Xbox in terms of growth, and, and this was also one of the key bets in the Activision acquisition, was was mobile. Mm -hmm. What's what's the Xbox plan for future mobile gaming, and, and when can we finally see it? So that was supposedly the whole driver behind them buying Activision Blizzard King, so they could get in on their mobile franchises like Candy Crush and all these kind of things. So let's see. Yeah. It, um... Yeah, it's, it, it feels like it's been a long time since we announced the Activision acquisition, which we completed in October. Uh, and we've still not seen any games in Game Pass yet. What's going on? Who here? Let me know in the comments if you think they're going lukewarm on putting all those games into Game Pass or Game Pass Ultimate. They're maybe thinking, oh, we sell Call of Duty every year for $70 and now we could lose all that money. Maybe we'll add in a... Game Pass Ultimate Platinum tier, which is even more expensive, which gives you access to Call of Duty. Or they just don't add it and then it will be, there'll be riots. <laughs> and the whole thesis about that, a lot of why we did it was about mobile. Mm -hmm. And we felt strongly that there has been an opportunity for there to be an experience on mobile that is centered around gamers. Like we talk a lot about how there's three billion gamers in the world. Um, two of those uh, billion play on mobile, and half of those actually play on mobile and they play on another device. But there isn't actually a gaming platform and store experience that is centered around players and goes truly across device, where who you are, your library, your identity, your rewards, um, that, that travels with you versus being locked to a single ecosystem. Um, and we've... I know it's not, but this sounds like Web3 NFT style chat, doesn't it? Recognize that opportunity for a long time, but we wanted to make sure that anything we built was really grounded in people who play those mobile native games and the creators of them. And so being joined with a team that has real deep expertise in mobile was important to us. Uh, but we are that now. Uh, and so in July, we are going to be launching our mobile store experience. Uh, we're going to start, actually, by bringing our own first-party portfolio to that. So you're going to see games like Candy Crush show up in that experience, games like Minecraft. Um, so mobile games that already exist, they're just... They're now going to be available on their store as well as the Apple Store or the Google, or the Google Play Store? Okay. And then we're going to extend that capability to partners... Uh, so that they can also take advantage of it and have a true cross-platform gaming-centric mobile experience. We're going to start on the web, uh, and we're doing that because that really allows us to have it be an experience that's accessible across all devices, all countries, no matter what, independent of the policies of you know, closed ecosystem stores. Uh, and then we're going to extend from there. That sounds weird. So, so it's so it's a web app, so you know you can add your any website to your homepage on your you know your phone as a shortcut, and it'll just live there. But if you go to like xbox.com forward slash store or whatever it is, they've got they've got a web store. Like you can just go and you can buy your games and stuff like that. Like she's excited. I don't. I I just assume she can't tell us, you know, what they're actually doing, you know, it's maybe under wraps, NDAs and stuff like that, but I don't, I don't get this. Let me know in the, in the comments if any of you guys or gals understand this because I'm struggling with this one. So I'm just, I'm excited about it just because it's something that we've wanted to do for a long time. We've heard gamers talking about it for a long time. What gamers have been talking about this? I, I, like legit, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with mobile gaming. I play it every so often you know i like playing emulators now on on i've got an iphone so i can now do that but it's like i don't know i'm maybe not in the market for this but i just i think xbox gamers are more concerned about the direction and the strategy of xbox overall because it seems to be they are the jack of all trades master of none and people are like you know like what are xbox what does Xbox mean to you? If you ask someone, what does it stand for? Back in the 360 days, they were kind of edgy, cool, bunch of different types of games to check out. Now, it's like, 
you know, they're even moving all their exclusives to like PlayStation 5 to make them some money. I think because Game Pass is not making them enough money for the development costs of these games. That's what I assume. They'll be putting some games on Switch. They're wanting to stream them. They're on PC. It's like... You say, what's... What, Maybe you ask people about PlayStation, they'd say, oh, big AAA, you know, adventure, story-driven games. You say, what's Nintendo? You think, you know, Mario, all the IPs which Nintendo own, which are just locked to Nintendo and, and are incredible. And then you go to Xbox, you know, it used to be like Halo and stuff like that. Halo Gears of War. Halo has been kind of MIA. I mean, Halo Infinite multiplayer, I do think is really good, but the campaign... Pff, it just felt like it wasn't finished, unfortunately. I don't know how they managed to mess that up. That could have been massive for Xbox if it was like a proper, polished, amazing triple A game for the launch. It was meant to be a launch title and it wasn't. It was delayed by a year. Um Gears, Gears 5, that was the last one. That was an Xbox One. I know we've had an update. We'll probably be getting Gear 6 soon, I would hope. And hopefully that's an absolute banger. Because let's get this clear. I want Sony, Xbox, and Nintendo all to be firing on all cylinders. Why? Because that's best for you and for me. Because if one of them is completely in charge, they'll be setting prices through the roof. They'll just get lazy, complacent. You want them all fighting each other for our eyeballs to play games. That is the best for all of us because then we get the best value, the best hardware, the best deals, the best games, you name it. So that is what I want. All this console war stupid shit where people are like oh this person never is no we want them all to be good because it's the best for us it's like you need batman and joker they're nothing without each other so <sighs> i don't get this whole thing about mobile store is what i'm trying to say so <laughs> let's see where this goes and we're now at the point where we can take those steps and so in in july when it launches we at that point at the beginning see candy crush and minecraft in it or how how soon or mm. You'll see things roll out over okay. time. Do you know how yeah. soon partners will be able to use it as well? You know, our goal is to get partners using it uh, shortly after launch. We really want to make sure we start and we scale um, using our own IP first. That allows us to make sure that the experience that we bring partners into really builds on all the quality and learning that we have as a team. Another big discussion point in the Activision acquisition was cloud gaming. and. How, how big that market really was, when will we really see it gain traction? Is it gaining users finally in, in any particular regions and scenarios? How, how is it doing? What do people use it for? Rip Stadia, that's all I'll say. I had Stadia, I had the Founders edition of Stadia, I pre-ordered it before it launched, and I'll tell you one thing, everyone hated on it. The business model sucked. Google did not do that well. They should have done it like a Game Pass style model or just had games to buy, but the actual technology worked amazing if you had a good internet connection. When Cyberpunk 2077 launched, I bought it on Stadia, played it on Stadia, and it ran amazing because it was a like a PC port when you had the PS4 and the Xbox One were, you know, setting themselves on fire trying to run it, really struggling. So this will be interesting to see because in certain areas of the world, obviously, their internet infrastructure is a lot better. Therefore, you know, streaming games is much more palatable idea um, but on the whole I think for worldwide that's why like mobile gaming is so big there's a lot of you know developing countries and even you know advanced economies mobile gaming is just so convenient everyone has a phone they can play their games you don't even need a really powerful phone to play a lot of mobile games whereas streaming games from the internet you do need good internet otherwise it is a shockingly bad experience uh, I think it has a place. I like it as an option because sometimes Xbox Cloud Gaming, maybe I've got I've got well I've got a Series S. I've got so many Xbox consoles. That's why I'm so interested in the future here, what they're actually doing. Um, but Series S, it's hardly any storage space. If there's a game I want to just check out and I don't have it downloaded and I don't have enough storage space, I can just click on Cloud Gaming and just quickly jump in and check it out as long as there's not a queue. But other than that, like, I don't like the idea of our all cloud gaming based future it just gives again microsoft sony all these kind of companies too much control and you've seen it with stuff where they can you know alter games with you know patches take games away from you like licenses expire they remove them i just don't like the idea of that that's why i always say by physically i know more and more 
you buy a disc and there's hardly anything on it, you need to download it, which sucks. So games that do ship in an amazing full, complete, full feature state physically, always support them. If it's a game you want, buy that instead of the digital version. But cloud gaming, it's a nice add-on, but I hope hope they don't make this a core element going forward. There was all the rumours about the uh, Microsoft streaming stick. They were going to sell for like $100 or whatever, a streaming stick and a controller. I don't like that idea. No like it. I like physical consoles and the rumours of this handheld. I'm all for an Xbox handheld. I think that would pair up really well with Game Pass. So let's see what she has to say here. And let me know what you think about cloud streaming. Have you tried it out? Have you used it? NVIDIA GeForce Now is fantastic. It works really well, but... I mean, the PC gaming has been in the digital realm for, like, the past decade anyway, so they're already there. But I don't like the idea of everyone going there. I hate the idea of a future where kids go into, like, a store and there's just no games on the shelves for them to check out and look. Like, picking up a game and looking at the game art and then, get, you know, buying it and going home in the car just checking out your game was just such a buzz. So, uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see how that goes. Yeah, so, um, you know... I Cloud gaming, for those that don't know, I don't know if um, everyone here in the audience is familiar with it, is just the, the ability to play a game natively from the cloud. So you don't need to actually have a piece of hardware in your home, and you can experience something that's AAA Xbox gaming on any device, regardless of the local compute that you have. Um, and we have been investing in that for some time because we really believe that opening up sort of these beautiful immersive experiences to more gamers is important for industry growth, for, um, for developers, and we know people want to play those experiences. Uh, and we're seeing tremendous growth there. We have more demand than, uh, than supply uh, in that area. Uh, and you'll see us rolling out more capacity um, introducing more options for people to jump in and play on the cloud. I mean, that, that's a perfectly fine answer. I agree with that. It would be good if we actually got like details from Xbox on like player numbers using these uh, services. But one thing I just want to pick up on there when she mentioned, you know, AAA Xbox experiences, and this isn't, this doesn't apply just to Xbox. This is an industry thing, and I guess. That's why I'm more curious about this for the whole industry because Xbox is a massive player, one that I'm invested in along with the rest of them. I have all the systems. I love them all. I just love gaming. I want it to be successful and healthy. Um, but this idea of AAA gaming, I think we need to revisit and review and change what AAA gaming mean, means. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, back in the day when I was a kid, a AAA game was like a mark of quality. It was a big game everyone was hyped for. There was so much momentum around a game leading up to its launch. People used to queue at midnight, you know, to get their hands on a copy. And it was like game of the year, each one that was a AAA game, you know, and they'd all battle it out for game of the year. Um, and it was like a seal of quality being called a AAA game. Now, well, now being called a AAA game, it just seems to be they spent a ton of money on it. It's like, and a lot of them are garbage. It's like, <sighs> you, do you know what I mean? It's just so frustrating. I think AAA gaming should be meaning AAA gaming is a high quality product, a high quality game. Not we've just spent 100 million or 200 million on this game and it's absolutely trash. No one wants to play it. And I'm not even going to na name games that, are like that because this is not a you know to bash any games or developers but I bet you all of you in the comments could leave some games down there that are meant to be triple A games in the past year that have just fallen on their face they've been terrible so yeah triple A gaming we need to change what that means for you me and for the industry I think that would really help because a lot of the best games just now as well are indie games that's where all the innovation is all the fun is it's not just you know rehashing stuff all the time or trying to have safe bets even a lot of the safe bets don't work out so very interesting anyways onwards back to cloud gaming is it growing faster than the overall market we were talking about the market yeah, itself yeah. is down where where yeah. is cloud gaming where? it is for it is growing faster than the overall market really bringing in new players um and growth for us 
So it's an area where we're investing more and we're excited about. Earlier this year, Xbox announced for the first time that it was bringing a, a slate of Xbox developed games, Xbox exclusive games, to rival platforms. By the way, round of applause to this interviewer. She's doing a good job. She's asking some really good, insightful, tough questions, which is great. Sometimes, you, you know, you see when it's like, for example, maybe Phil Spencer's out there or Matt Booty, and it seems like, you know, maybe they go to friendly territory sometimes. Um, Phil, I've seen some pretty good, hard interviews, and he's been really honest, not so much Matt, but you're like, come on, ask this, ask this, and then they don't, or they sugarcoat it. She's, and it's not in a, a hostile way, she's just asking really good questions, which I think are valid, and I would like to have uh, asked or have answered, so very good. Well done, Dina. GG's to you. Sony's PlayStation, Nintendo Switch. Uh that obviously was a big change. It was a little bit unsettling for some of the Xbox hardware fans. Yes. How is it going so far? Do you have any data about how the games are doing? Just do PlayStation gamers really want to play Sea of Thieves? Right, people, everybody who's watching it, if you're still here, let me know in the comments if you're an Xbox player, what you think about this. Now, you get all these people that say, oh, it's great, you know, just you should be able to play your games everywhere and anywhere on any system. That's fine. But this sucks for Xbox hardware. This will do damage. I don't care what anyone says. It really, really will. Because people then say, what's the point of buying an Xbox? I'll just get a PlayStation, then I can play Spider-Man, uh, God of War, uh, Horizon Forbidden West. And if I want to play Sea of Thieves, I can play that as well. It is just not good. Like... It, that's why you see Netflix and they have their Netflix exclusives that you can only watch there because that draws people into the ecosystem, makes them buy their product. Console gaming has always been like that and it is like that. I'm not saying the way things have always been done is the way they should always be done in the future, but that is just the nature of this beast. So to protect Xbox hardware, if Xbox want to make a lot of money, ship Halo and Gears of War onto PlayStation 5, they will make a ton of money. I know all my buddies who have PlayStation, they'll all be picking it up. They'll be like, yep, I'm up for that. But if you want to protect Xbox's hardware future, to have a hardware future, that's not a good move. Seriously, it's really not. Um, yeah, I'm intrigued to see what she says here. Because they will sell. It's no, PlayStation gamers buy games. Xbox gamers on the whole, compared to PlayStation and Switch, do not. They've been conditioned with Game Pass that is like, I'll just wait for it to come on Game Pass. I mean, Game Pass is such an amazing deal. You buy this thing, you just get all these games, but it's maybe not good for Xbox's bottom line. So, very interesting, which is why earlier on I said about Call of Duty. What are they going to do with Call of Duty? $70 game which sells millions of units every single year. Whether it's good or bad, no matter what you think about Call of Duty, it sells tons of units. Are they going to just, you know, water that down and put it into Game Pass? They might do because, I mean, I think plays, Xbox is in third place with about 22 million hardware units sold. You know, it's about less than half PlayStation 5 and the Switch is at like, I think it's 140 million it's sold in its life cycle. Granted, it's longer, seven years, but it's still way back, so they might be willing to take that hit. And then the, the loss leader, you could call it, could be that, well, we've got it in Game Pass, so that's maybe a reason for people to pick up an Xbox and pick up Game Pass because, you know what, you get Call of Duty included in your subscription. You don't need to fork out $70 every year, so I'm so interested to see how this pans out, people. I really, really am. Because... It seems like they don't have a plan. It seems like they keep changing with the weather and just throwing stuff to see what sticks. Um, and a lot of people are frustrated with Xbox's messaging. It's just not good. Um, especially, I mean, even their advertising stuff the other day, they had that f limited edition flame controller, Feel the Burn. They posted that right when they were laying off a bunch of their studios. Um, one of their marketing execs shared something about, you know, uh, kind of all for one, you know, Xbox is for developers and gamers and all this stuff. And Sarah Bond retweeted it with, you know, she loves her emojis, like the green love hearts and all this kind of stuff. And then then that happens, they, they shut down the, the studios. It's just like, it feels disconnected. Is Microsoft calling the shots now? And these guys running Xbox are kind of caught in the back foot? Or I don't know, it's just so weird. So weird. <laughs> You know, it's early days, uh, yet. 
that doesn't inspire much confidence. So do people actually want to play your games on PlayStation? It's early days. That's when you say, yes, they do, absolutely. I'm sure Sea of Thieves and a bunch of them were like in the top sellers recently on PlayStation, on the PlayStation blog. So I don't have specific data to share, but, we're, but we are really encouraged by the reception um, of our games. And one thing that I, you know, I think it's important to note is, you know, as Xbox, we've been putting games on other platforms for a long time. <laughs> right. I don't like this. I feel like this is trying to rewrite history. Yes, they have. But there's always been console exclusives. And they have stayed locked to a console, which is the reason people then want to buy that console. This whole stuff, like, so they've bought, like, Mike, uh, they bought Minecraft. It's, it was already on every system, pretty much. You know, they bought uh, Bethesda, you know, so you've got the Doom games and stuff like that. Fallout games. And I agree with the whole thing of being on console and PC. I think that's good and healthy. But I think then there needs separation between the consoles. So PlayStation can release their stuff day one on PlayStation and PC. Xbox already do that as well. Nintendo might even do that in the future as well. That would be that would be mad. I don't actually see that happening. But that's cool. But what I mean is now Xbox, they've never been like firing over their exclusives onto PlayStation. Can you imagine if Halo goes on to PlayStation? <laughs> And here, by the way, that might happen, especially Halo Infinite, free-to-play multiplayer element. I could see Microsoft licking their lips at the money they would make from that, you know, from all the like, battle passes and the in-game store content. So, and I don't think people would be happy because, again, what's the point of having an Xbox then? Unless they are just going full third-party development studio future. Microsoft's history is software, I guess, so we will see. Minecraft is available pretty much universally. <laughs> what I just said, Minecraft, I know. And oh, I have not watched this interview. I have not seen this. I've not seen any of it. I know tons of other YouTubers have, you know, ripped this apart and reacted to it and stuff because I've seen all the thumbnails and stuff. That's, I was like, well, what's happened here? And then I had a few people message me and my mates actually sent me uh, a link to this saying, you need to watch this. I was like, okay, so I'll just watch it and react to it. So I don't think it's been horrifically bad unless we're halfway through, but it's, it's not been good, you know? Um, yeah, interesting. Um, you know, the teams at Bethesda have had games on other platforms. The team of course they have. They were all like that before you bought them. Come on. Teams at Activision Blizzard have games on other platforms. And so it's a decision we just make on a game-by-game on a -game basis. Um, as we move forward and continue to execute on our strategy. Game by game basis. So that's again, no clearer for us gamers what's going where. Hopefully at this uh, Xbox showcase we've got next month, when they launch the games, they will say right away on it, it's come to Xbox, PlayStation 5 or, or not. Um, instead of just leaving it, you know, blank or just putting up something like coming to console. What does that mean? You know, it was always exclusive to Xbox. <sighs> I don't know. You know what's really frustrating about this? So Microsoft have, you know, been trying to compete with Sony. They've went into their deep, deep pockets, bought Bethesda for was it four or six billion or eight billion, whatever it was. Activision, Blizzard, King for $70 billion. Now they've got all these amazing studios and surely they're cooking up some good games in there. If not, what the hell are they doing? That is the perfect time to have all these games being exclusive on your Xbox platform, your Xbox console, to really help console sales. But instead, they've now got probably the strongest studio lineup they've ever had, and now they're just opening the doors and sending the games everywhere. Which is cool, if that's what they want to do, but just tell us, be clear. It's like, it's clear as mud half the time, the messaging, it seems to flip-flop Phil in that Phil, Matt and Sarah at that first like weird announcement where they had the, the podcast because there was basically outrage in the community that all their exclusives were going to PlayStation then it was an ops only four games blah 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 and then I'm sure Phil had a interview the next day with Tom Warren and then he kind of said 
that's the first four to, to start with or something like that and then now case by case basis it's like <sighs> gear six gets announced at this showcase and then this it's going to playstation day and day as well how you feel about that will you be happy do you not care whatever it's it's, it's very interesting it's very very interesting and i've not really commented on any of this stuff i commented in a couple of live streams so my viewpoints have not changed so this is not new news but i've just not made like a bunch of videos on this because I keep jumping on you know negative stuff trying to always have positive stuff in the channel but this is just getting too much xbox just seem to be shooting themselves in the foot all the time so here we are trying to figure this all out together seriously as well though like I thought Sarah Bond and some of the other events was really, really good. And I'm sure she is really good. But she does not look comfortable, does she? Like, this is a, you know, president of Xbox and they've had this tough news where they've closed these studios and then this, say this, I'd imagine this was booked in well before, well, you would think if they were closing a studio they would know well in advance, maybe they didn't know the exact date of the messaging, but... If this was going to be a really no-go, awkward chat, you'd think you'd maybe just actually pull out of it, you know, cite some other reason or whatever, but, you know, to her credit, she's here, but the downside is it's it's not it's not been very good. It's been kind of, hmm, a lot of PR speak, not really much actual kind of substance or answers to anything, I don't think. What do you think? Um, I mean... At the same time, you know, we've talked about mobile, we've talked mm -hmm. about uh, cloud. I mean, of course, Xbox itself's heritage is in console. And, you know, the mm -hmm. energy around the console right now is a little challenged. Many mm -hmm. of the hardcore long-term customers are worried. Um, they're worried about the release on other platforms. They're worried that um, that may indicate that Xbox is defocusing its own hardware. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what do you say to them? Um, how do you make them feel like Xbox is still for them? This interview is fantastic. Great questions. Yeah, I mean, first, the the worry that that I see um, is happening across the industry, and I think is a lot of what we're seeing just industry all up. But specific to what I don't I don't hear it. PlayStation players saying these same things. I don't hear Nintendo players saying these saying these same things. And I've got all of them, and this is the only one that I have this feeling with. What's going to happen with Xbox? Are they going to bail out of making hardware, which I hope they don't. Core gamers, my focus um, has really been on engineering and building that next generation hardware experience that really, really taps in to their needs. Uh, I talked about this a little bit publicly a few months ago. I talked about how you know our focus is on delivering the biggest leap ever. Um, and that's about really thinking through every aspect of what that hardware and what that experience delivers with the core gamer in mind. And that is about power and performance. That's absolutely a part of it. Um, but it's also about the ability to be able to play all of the games. I mean, we have people who have been playing on Xbox for decades and invested thousands and thousands of dollars and hours with us and to be able to take all of those games with them into the hardware of the future. Um, so one of the decisions I made when I came in and became president of Xbox was to establish a team dedicated to that, to, to game preservation and ensuring that future generations, future iterations, that you get to take those things with you forward. Um, you know, the next part of that uh, is saying, okay, I get to bring those games with me, I'm invested in those games, I get an incredible high performance experience on my console, but also continuing our commitment to make sure that gamers can bring their games with them wherever they want to play. That my Xbox library is something that can go with me and that I can enjoy with others. So our long-term commitment to cross-play is part of that, um, and our commitment to cross-progression and cloud saves so you can pick up on one device and you can play on another is part of that. Xbox is actually really good at that, the whole cloud saves and stuff like that. It does work really well. I think it works better than PlayStation. Um, and also our investments in cloud gaming, which you referenced earlier, a lot of those who use cloud gaming are people who own a console. They're just, you know, they want to play it on another device and go somewhere else. So that's the second piece. And then the last piece um, is about Game Pass. We know our core users uh, love Game Pass. 
uh, Game Pass is a, a gaming subscription. You get um, a whole portfolio of games, but importantly, you get every single one of our games that we build day one in Game Pass. And the quality and the breadth of those games has only been going up over time, and you're going to... I agree with that is, that is amazing and getting the games day one is fantastic with the quality of games going up over time. I, I disagree. I see some more really big games uh, going into Game Pass later this year. From Activision's uh, um, portfolio? Across or? the whole slate. Across the whole slate. You're going to see some... <clears throat> That's so interesting that so she's kind of confirming saying yes when the interviewer says from Activision. She goes from the whole, whole slate. But she doesn't just say yes which makes me think there's something going on there. What is that, though? We spoke about that earlier. Is that going to be a new tier of Game Pass? Are these new games not going to go in day one? Are they... I don't know. Because if that messaging changes, that's not going to be good as well. Like I say, the message is just not clear. Clear messaging, please, Xbox. Some really amazing things. Um, and keeping that as something that is really special for Xbox players is central for us. The whole conversation there about you know your your previous you know your older game library and stuff like that that's really interesting because does this also mean that the backwards compatibility team has been revived or they didn't actually shut down it sounded like they had stopped because they were not adding any more titles to that backwards compatibility library so I assumed that team had been disbanded maybe they've not maybe they have and now they're bringing the band back together again but does this go further than this? Is this just then... I wonder if this is so you can play your backwards compatible games that they've already got via the cloud, because you can't do that just now, I don't think. And you also can't stream... You can't play your backwards... Sorry, you can play some of them. You can't play your backwards compatible games via remote play, which is kind of annoying. Yeah, well, I've not been able to do it on, on my absolute device. So... Yeah, this is interesting, or is this all the Activision games, you know, there's a huge, there's an insane catalogue of older games there that they could tap into and bring to back compat, which I would love. I personally think backwards compatibility is one of the best and most underrated things which Xbox has and has done. I remember when Phil announced that way, way back, was it an E3 sometime or something like that? I remember the big Xbox event, but... And it was amazing. It was it's so good. It's probably, actually is, probably 90% of my gaming on Xbox is playing Xbox 360 games. They're just so good and it's so easy to be able to play them, either if you have the physical disc or just quite often have sales on Xbox Store. You can pick up some amazing games for like, you know, a dollar or two. So it's going to be interesting to, to find out more about this team she's saying she's set up and what they're actually doing. Um, because nobody really knows. And as much as she told us there, it's still very vague. So it can mean a lot of things. Hopefully again, at this showcase, we get more insight. A lot of the focus at this, this conference today has been AI. Um, and mm. but AI for gamers is a little different than we talk about AI for the enterprise or for yeah. healthcare. I, where do you think AI will be important, both to, to players and to game developers? And how is Microsoft investing against that? Yeah. Um. I didn't hear all the talks uh, today, uh, but I think we can all confidently say that we are right at the beginning of what AI means for us as a society um, and for businesses in general, and that's absolutely true in gaming as well. Um, in, you know, for us, we take our responsibility around AI as Microsoft very seriously and being really, really thoughtful about what we do. And as Xbox, uh, you know, there's something really unique about being a gaming company that is part of a major AI company. Mm, open um, AI. And so all of our focus within our team is about how we ensure that gaming AI is really crafted in a way that delivers unique and delightful experiences to players um, and adds real value for developers. So... There's three things we look at as part of that. Uh, the first is around developer velocity. How do we give developers tools to make it easier for them to realize their creations, to speed up iteration cycles, and also, frankly, to make it easier for people who may not have as much in-depth training on game development to build a game? 
Um, we know that with that, there's just going to be a huge proliferation of gaming content and options out there. So that leads us very naturally to the next layer where we're investing a lot, which is around discovery and making sure that people can really be matched with the game experience that we know that they'll love and that a whole range of creations can be discovered from the biggest games, but also from something novel and new that you may not have intuitively known to look for, but you're going to love if you experience it. And then the last piece is around the actual experience in the game. Um, engagement, delight, um, you know, playing through and having a fun time, not getting stuck, all the things that come with that uh, so that you can get really the most out of the game experience. So we are early in this, as I said, you'll see us share things and things will come out during the course of the year. But our focus just really continues to be on keeping player at the center, keeping the developer at the center, and how AI turns up Great. in gaming. Excellent. Interesting points there. My 10 cents on that, if anyone cares. The first point there, which was talking about enabling developers. Yeah, sounds great, sounds amazing. My worry, there's been so much layoffs in the industry. You know, absolutely you know, incredible industry that gives us all these amazing games and experiences. Just been getting hammered lately. It's just horrible to see people losing their jobs. And I just hope AI does not um, add to that problem, you know, by, you know, you already see stuff with maybe, you know, companies using like AI generated artwork or AI generated video instead of, you know, paying an artist or getting a, you know, an actor and a camera crew or whatever it is because it's a lot cheaper for them. So I hope that does not happen in the gaming space. I won't hold my breath, but I mean, it'll probably happen in every industry. It's probably going to turn a lot of careers and jobs and industries upside down, but that's just a worry there. But the flip side, hopefully it can enable them to do, you know, things as good as what they're doing now or even better, quicker. That'd be pretty cool. Um, the second point there, what did you say? About discovery. That's really interesting. That's going to be cool. If, if any of you have used any of these AI uh, models, you know, where you chat to them, that's going to be amazing for finding games. You can say, oh, I like this kind of game. I like games like um, Warhammer 40k Bolt Gun, but I like it in this kind of art style. Uh, and I only want it to be a couple of hours long because I don't have much time because uh, I'm working and then I'm out with the kids and then it will go, boom, boom, here's a whole bunch of games that you might like that are only a couple of hours long and they're first person shooters in, you know, this cell shaded art style, art style. It's going to be awesome for stuff like that instead of, I mean, the Microsoft search on their store just now and on Game Pass is absolute garbage. So that's, that is going to make a huge difference. That'll be cool for the, the gamers. Um, quality of life enhancements there for you know, searching for games, buying games, looking for games on Game Pass, all that kind of stuff. Or who, maybe you just use voice as well, that'd be cool. Um, and then last, what did she say there? So the first one, she was talking about developers, the second one was search, third one was in-game, in-game. I mean, I wonder if the next hardware from Xbox is going to be really focused on like using generative AI for the visuals. You've seen some of these videos which OpenAI have released where they've got, I can't remember if it's called Sorna or something like that. And it basically is generating video in real time. And it looks, it looks insane. It's, it really does look insane. Uh, you just imagine like a horror game like Resident Evil 16 on that. It would be terrifying. Um, but then even more simpler, quick wins. Just imagine NPCs. You know, you're kicking about in Cyberpunk 2077 or, you know, The Witcher or something like that. And you go up and talk to the NPCs and you actually have an actual conversation with them because it's an AI language model that's behind it instead of just, you know, select, you know, a couple of lines of text, you know, as you're, what you're going to say and what their response says and how you react. It can be an actual conversation. That can be pretty cool. Or, you know, your AI companions with you are not absolutely garbage at the game, which quite often happens if it's a co-op multiplayer game where you're in there with your buddies, you're going absolutely beast mode, slaying everything, and then your buddies aren't about, so you need to play with the, you know, the CPU characters, and they're absolute dog shit at the game. So having some, you know, legit AI in there, maybe like the Terminator in there backing you up, you know, you could still be hauling ass. So 
it's exciting times. It's interesting to see how this goes. Well, Xbox President Sarah Bond, thank you so All much right. for your time. <laughs> Thanks. Well, that's that done, people. What do we think about that? What do we think? What's our key takeaways there? Any? I thought that was really interesting. A lot of kind of, a lot of not a lot there, is all I'd say. Um, I did think she looked really uncomfortable, um, to be honest with you. Um, I don't think it was as bad as some of the kind of headlines and it's probably just the usual YouTube clickbait stuff, you know, um, saying that, it's, oh, it's the worst thing ever. I don't think it was that bad, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a bit, a bit kind of cringe, well, the kind of PR thing, that's probably what I would say. It was a bit cringe. That's probably a, a fair assessment because it felt like a lot of PR speak versus um, just, you know, truthfully saying, you know what, these studios, you know, we look at the success of each of the games. These games weren't successful um, and that was the reason we decided to, you know, close them down, reallocate them onto other projects, whatever, instead of you know, Fallout, the TV show's amazing, have you seen it? It's like, <sighs> so I think she was maybe not expecting that level of deep questioning or tough questioning there, like maybe caught her off guard, um, but on the whole it was okay, we didn't get a lot from it I think, so it'll be interesting to see if in the future if we hear from maybe Phil, what's he been saying, he's been busy getting nuked in Fallout 76 and it looks like he's gearing up to retaliate, which is quite funny, uh, and then Matt Booty, like, <sighs> who knows what the hell he does so um it'd be good to hear from them if not i think it might be calm silence from them all until we get to the xbox showcase which we will be live streaming here and reacting to in real time so if you love all things xbox make sure you subscribe to the channel and yeah if you're curious about xbox game pass and which tiers are good and which are terrible and which ones you should avoid make sure you check it out on screen in this next video right now as there is one tier you definitely want to avoid